Hello, this will be your discussion on diabetes mellitus. So your diabetes mellitus is considered to be a metabolic disorder characterized by glucose intolerance which is caused by an imbalance between the supply and demand of your insulin. So highlighted there is metabolic disorder meaning there is a problem with metabolism primarily of your glucose. Take note there is glucose intolerance meaning the body is not tolerating the increased amount of glucose in the blood because there is no insulin okay, that will be able to metabolize your glucose. Hence, the main problem in your diabetes mellitus is the imbalance between your insulin supply and demand. Take note that your diabetes mellitus is way different from your diabetes insipidus. Your diabetes mellitus is heralded by the three Ps, whereas your diabetes insipidus is heralded by the two Ps. However, the origin of your diabetes insipidus is different when it comes to the etiology of the hormones. Now, there are several types of diabetes, type 1, type 2, and gestational diabetes. Your type 1 diabetes is also known as IDDM. IDDM is insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. Type 2 is non-insulin-dependent. And then you have your gestational diabetes. Now, if your patient has type 1 diabetes mellitus, that would mean that your patient may have an idiopathic type of diabetes or an autoimmune type of diabetes. Between the two types of diabetes, it is your type 1 that is usually detected in early stage. And then your type 1 has hereditary implications compared to that of of type 2. Okay? Don't be confused. Both types of diabetes has uh, dietary implications and hereditary implications. However, the hereditary implications is stronger in your type 1 diabetes mellitus. Okay? So, the problem in type 1 is that there is absence of insulin. In type 2, there is lack of insulin. Okay? There is still some insulin in type 2. However, it's lacking to support the metabolism of your glucose. For gestational diabetes, as the term would imply, gestational diabetes is among your pregnant patients. Okay? Due to the hormonal changes brought about by pregnancy, there is an increase in blood sugar levels of your pregnant patient. The concern is, if the gestational diabetes is not managed and not coupled with lifestyle and then medication and then dietary changes, your patient may progress towards your type 2 diabetes mellitus. Etiology So, for the causes or possible causes of your diabetes, one is possible autoimmune mechanism. Specifically, if we're talking about your juvenile diabetes or your diabetes mellitus type 1. Second, viral infection at an early age. The presence of your viral infection may possibly uh, cause autoimmune responses. Then, genetic implications. As previously mentioned, there is a strong hereditary component, especially for your type 1 diabetes. Then, you have the destruction of your pancreatic islet cells. Remember, it is the islet cells or the islet of Langerhans cells that produces your insulin. So, with the destruction of this cell, which may be brought about by side effects of chemotherapy or maybe excessive use of alcohol, okay, your patient is more likely to develop insulin resistance due to the decrease also of insulin and increased levels of blood sugar. Then, excessive blood glucose levels that is related to your diet. Perhaps the significant risk factor which can be modified among our patients. And then, your obesity. Let's try to understand the pathophysiology of your diabetes mellitus. As previously mentioned, the problem in diabetes is that there is insufficient insulin. Because of this, there will be abnormal carbohydrate levels in the bloodstream. What do we mean by that? Okay, there will be an increase of blood sugar levels in the bloodstream. Meaning, there is sugar in the bloodstream. However, because of the lack of insulin, the sugar in the bloodstream could not be properly metabolized. Due to the failure of this glucose to be metabolized, the body would perceive that it needs more energy. With that, the body would opt for other sources of energy. These other sources of energy would include your fat and proteins. So your body would have the fat and protein metabolism. Okay, due to the fat and protein metabolism, ketone bodies would occur. Because remember, the byproduct of your fat metabolism is your ketone bodies. And with the accumulation of your ketone bodies, okay, there will be ketoacidosis. So, 
one problem that you can have in a patient with diabetes is the condition that we refer to as your diabetic ketoacidosis. So once your patient is undergoing diabetic ketoacidosis, you would know that the patient does not have insulin in order to metabolize glucose, hence body opted for fat metabolism. Also, remember that one of the function of your insulin is to prevent the breakdown of your fats. In this case, there is no insulin that can prevent the breakdown of your fats. Because there is no insulin that can prevent that breakdown, fat would become ketones in our bloodstream. Hence, it would manifest as ketoacidosis. So, you now know that if your patient is diabetic, the common ABG problem that can occur to your patient is metabolic acidosis and all the signs are pertaining to that. So your patient may have coma, your patient may have respiratory problems related to your metabolic acidosis. So your ketoacidosis is already considered to be an emergency which needs to be managed promptly because if not, might result to death of our patient. Okay? Furthermore, so uh, there is cell starvation. So going back to the concept of cell starvation, there is again enough glucose. However, your body perceives that it is being starved because the glucose could not be properly metabolized. Remember, our body does not use glucose specifically, but it is the ATP that is derived from this glucose. So because of the starvation of the cells, the body would have opt again for protein metabolism. And by opting to protein metabolism, amino acids would be there. And then liver would form glucose through the amino acids in the process referred to as gluconeogenesis. And then there will be glycogenolysis, which is the breakdown of your glycogen to glucose. Hence, look at that. Okay, Your patient is forming glucose from amino acids and then breaking down glycogen to become glucose. What happens? There will be a worsening of your hyperglycemia. So it becomes a sequelae already that worsens the hyperglycemia of your patient. Due to this, what can possibly happen to our patient? So there will be metabolic changes. Remember, glucose is supposed to be the main source of energy for our patients. But due to the decreased metabolism of glucose, the organs will not be able to function properly. There will be fluid and electrolyte imbalance. Later on, you will know that polyuria and polydipsia is among the manifestations of your diabetes. And then because of the acidotic state of your patient, your patient will also have problems with potassium. Now, try to recall, if your patient has acidosis, what would happen to the blood potassium levels? Then, changes in immunity and inflammation. Due to the increase in the blood sugar levels, the immune system of your patient will be impaired. Your patient will be at risk for infection. Okay. In terms of inflammatory responses, your patient would have decreased pain perception due to neuropathy. In other words, the nerves of your patient are already damaged in such a way that it is not able to feel or sense anything properly. Hence, neuropathy. And then there will be changes in oxygenation. The change in oxygenation is usually brought about by the acidotic state of your patient. And then other than that, may be caused by infection. Your patient is at high risk for hospital-acquired infection due to the presence of high glucose levels. Changes in perception, especially if your patient is having your honk, okay, your hyperosmolar non-ketotic coma, or your diabetic ketoacidosis. And then there will also be problems in coordination. So, in other words, there are several effects on uh, diabetes and it is effect tend to become multi-organ. Okay, there is involvement of several organs. Now, what are the assessment findings? So, there will be three P's. The three P's is summarized as polyuria, polyphagia, and polydipsia. So, polyuria, urea, increase in urine. Polyphagia, phagia is your um, eating, so a lot of eating. And then you have your polydipsia, dipsia is drinking, so increase amounts of fluid intake. Uh, with that being said, okay, try, try to rationalize. What do you think among the three P's would occur first? Okay, among the three P's, what would occur first? 
think of cell starvation for you to answer this question. Once you've answered that question, try to figure out what occurs next and what is the rationale, why would it occur, and then what would be the third P. Okay? So there is a proper order for the three Ps as the manifestation of diabetes. Your patient would also become easily fatigued. The easy fatigability on the part of the patient is also because of the lack of glucose that is being metabolized. So because of this, your muscles will not be able to function properly and then your body would perceive that there is lack of energy. Then poor wound healing is secondary to the increase of sugar levels, again leading to infection, and then also related to the changes on the blood vessels, your patient may have poor circulation towards the affected site. Hence, Rhea, leading to poor wound healing. So, oftentimes, if you have uh, seen patients who have diabetic foot, it's one complication of diabetes, so it results to gangrene. Okay? The infection usually results to gangrene if not managed early. And then, uh, there are patients who are being amputated because of uh, ascending infection from the lower extremity. That's why wound care is very crucial if we're talking about patients with diabetes. For the laboratories, your patient would have an increase of your fasting blood sugar, an increase of your RBS. And then if your patient is on poor medication control, your patient would have an uh, increase of your HbA1c. By the way, as mentioned, your HbA1c is used for medication compliance as it can uh, detect the blood sugar levels or blood sugar control, I mean, for the past two to three months. So if the patient is unable to reach the... Um, percentage of HbA1c which is being set as target by the physician, meaning there needs to be a modification of the therapy that the patient is undergoing. Okay, so the usual target for a diabetic patient is to maintain an HbA1c of 6 to 7 percent. Let's talk about the therapeutic management for a patient with diabetes. Big word there is that there is no cure for this. Okay, this is a lifestyle, lifestyle a disorder um, our goal is just to control the blood sugar levels of the patient. Okay? In other words, uh, if your patient has type 1 diabetes mellitus, your patient needs to be maintained on insulin therapy for the lifetime, or else your patient's blood sugar levels would be very high until your patient would have complications. Diet is important. Exercise will be there. Monitoring, meaning you expect your patients to be on regular laboratory monitoring. Usually, they are being monitored every three to six months depending on their response to the therapy. Furthermore, pharmacologic therapy is there and then education is important. Okay, if you have noticed, pharmacologic therapy is not the first on the list okay, because our focus is lifestyle modification, meaning diet and activity is the one which is uh, considered to be the cornerstone in the management of a patient with diabetes. So, diet is considered to be the cornerstone for management. Our plan is for the diet to be consistent with the insulin resources of the patient to achieve the ideal body weight. If your patient has been newly diagnosed with diabetes, you don't tell them to stop eating carbohydrates or you don't tell them to reduce their diet suddenly. A sudden reduction of diet for a patient with diabetes might lead to hypoglycemia, which could be a possible cause also of coma and complications to your patient. So when we talk about diet in diabetes, they need to have three regular meals and and then two snacks in a day. It does not mean that because they have a sugar problem, they need to skip meals for their sugar to be controlled. Okay, what we would want is that the diet is regulated but not reduced or omitted. Reduction or omission of your diet is not beneficial for a patient with diabetes. So this is the ADA, American Diabetes Association recommendation for calorie distribution. In the case of carbohydrates, the recommendation is 50 to 60 percent. For the fats, the recommended distribution is 30 to 35 percent, whereas for proteins, the recommendation is 10 to 20 percent. So fiber is recommended to be at 25 grams daily. Okay, so the diet prescription is based on the patient's ideal body weight in kilograms. So we advise your patient that you do not just copy the diet of another patient because usually the management for them is individualized. Okay, then 
So these are the food that are not allowed for the patient with diabetes. So usually your concentrated carbohydrates are not recommended for this patient. Examples of which are your table sugar, candy, honey, molasses, and then your caro syrup. Then you have your jams and jelly, pies, cakes, cookies, pastries, your regular soft drinks, okay, your soda, and then your candy coated gum. So these are concentrated carbohydrates. Then we have your diabetic exchange list, which is the most common tool for nutritional management. So your diabetic exchange list would be able to have the equivalent of each food when it comes to its serving. So it can say if how many servings of rice should you have in a meal, how many servings of chocolates can you have in a day, okay, and uh, other than that. So for the exercise and activity plan, our goal for exercise is to have to reach the 60 to 75 percent of maximum heart rate for age. Okay, meaning we do not need the rigorous exercises here. We do not need gym level exercises for this. Okay, what we are expecting is that the patient will have activity, and this activity would be up to 75 percent of the maximum heart rate for age. Meaning, we do not want our patient to be tachycardic just because of the exercise. Okay, our recommendation is that this exercise should be more uh, at least 20 minutes up to 45 minutes in a week or minimum, I mean, of three times a week. So again, it's 20 to 45 per session, three times a week. So the effects of your exercise, which should be regular and moderate, okay, are as follows. It is expected to decrease your blood glucose. Why? So because the blood glucose level, um, metabolism, I mean, the blood glucose metabolism tends to increase with physical activity. Furthermore, your physical activity is related to weight reduction and maintenance. Also, it increases your insulin sensitivity, okay? meaning it allows your little insulin to act on the glucose on your bloodstream. It also decreases your blood pressure and then decreases your stress and tension. So, of course, the usual benefits of your exercise. So, uh, you advise your patient that before the exercise, there should be a five-minute workout. And then they should check their blood sugar. Usually, you advise them to bring their rescue candy, okay, uh, which is a, a high concentration of sugar, in such a way that if they will feel hypoglycemic during the exercise, they will have a rescue candy that they can take. After the exercise, you would educate them to include a five-minute cool-down and then also to check the blood sugar levels. Okay, Class, if your patient is a diabetic patient, they are prone either for hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia. Hyp the hypoglycemic episode is usually brought about by the failure of your patient to take their meals regularly or probably because of the increase on the use of your oral hypoglycemic agents. That's why in the use of your oral hypoglycemic agents, you need to be able to take note of the time, okay, the peak time of the action of the drug for you to know um, in when is hypoglycemia more likely to occur. Then um, we're talking about monitoring glucose levels. So we educate our patient on how to do the self-monitoring of blood glucose. Uh, there are patients who would need insulin dose adjustment depending on their present blood sugar levels. So that's why we need to teach them on how to monitor their blood glucose. Also, we educate our patients on the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia in such a way that if our patient will have signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, they will be able to check for their blood sugar levels and then act on it. Okay. On the succeeding lecture, we will be talking about the pharmacologic management for your diabetes. Thank you very much for your attention.